enough. I understand that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say on behalf of Hakan and myself, thanks to all of the speakers who came today for sharing their wisdom with all of us. Thank you to our principal, Ms. Naime Demirbash, for giving our students and our school the opportunity to have this TEDx event. And also thank you to Zainab Alp and all of the students who helped in the organization of this event. You did a great job. You should give yourselves a round of applause. So what, what's the most important subject to the youth? When we're reflecting on the name of our event today, TEDx Youth, of course, the answer is history. <laughs> so today, we decided to put together a short presentation. I know that it's running a bit late. We promise to keep it brief about critical junctures in history and the institutions that we have in our societies. Now, when I say the word institution, I mean the things that exist in our society which perform a service for us. A hospital, healthcare, a school, education, a police office, or a court, the law, the rules of society that we should all, in theory, adhere to. These are what institutions are, and all of our societies in the world are built on institutions. And it depends on the strength of the institutions in each country, whether or not a country is a success or a failure. Now, what is a critical juncture? Before we get to that, I'd like you to have a look at this picture on the right side of the screen. There are two countries in this picture. Do you know which ones? Any guesses? Not North and South Korea. Good guess, though. Not Syria. Very good, I heard it in the back. On one side is Mexico, on one side is the United States. Interestingly enough, with all this talk about building a wall, there actually is a wall already. You can see it in the middle. So there's a wall that separates these two places. In fact, the place names are the same. On the left side, we have Nogales, and on the right side, another Nogales. One is in America, one is in Mexico. On one side of the wall, the average median salary is $30,000 a year. There are good roads. There is good health care. There is a high life expectancy. Most adults have a high school diploma, and many adults have a university degree. There is reliable electricity, running water, roads. All of these things exist on one side of the wall. And in addition to that, a small thing uh, regarding the laws and the rules and the trust that people have in the police and the courts and all of the people and the government that should be protecting their rights. On the other side of the wall, the story is a bit different. The median salary is $10,000 a year, which is relatively high for Mexico, in fact. The roads are in bad conditions. People have a lower life expectancy. Infant mortality is at a very high rate. Mothers worry that their babies might die. Most teenagers don't go to high school. Most adults don't have a high school education. And if you want to do anything, for example, to start a business, usually you have to pay 10 to 15 bribes to 15 different people, and then hope that the mafia won't come to you and threaten to shut down your business if you don't give them 50% of your profits or more. Now, here's the question that's central to our presentation today. Why are some countries rich and other countries not so rich? Why are some countries, why do some countries have strong institutions and other countries have weak ones? We're going to take a look at three instances in history where countries had faced a critical juncture or a turning point in history. And we're going to prove to you that even though over the course of history, institutions are generally rigid, in the face of these critical junctures, societies can change. And the ones that change and go in a better direction are usually the ones that have more inclusive or more open political and economic institutions. Uh, thanks, Paul Teacher, for your presentation right now. I want to start my part with the agricultural revolution. As you might know, people started a, um, agricultural revolution 10, uh, in the 10,000 BCE and continued until the 14th century. So uh, what agricultural revolution is, it is a shift from hunter-gatherer tribes and societies 
to settle down societies. So this change didn't happen in a snap of a pin, uh, finger. It happened through the history and it had a lot of uh, results. So I want to ask a question. Why is the agricultural revolution a critical juncture? Well, basically, the societies became settled in fixed places, which resulted in the economic system starting and the social class happening. So as a result of this uh, social classes and uh, the economic systems, competition between the other lands and the other agricultural revolution started to heat up more than ever. So, and this led in the technological development as people need to, to find ways to improve themselves. So it not only improved our intelligence, it improved our science and technology. But the point I'm trying to make here is the earlier agricultural societies start, like the earlier they start the agricultural society, they have the upper hand against other societies. Now I'm going to pass the ball to the poll teacher. Thanks, Hakan. The second example we want to show you is called the Black Death. Most of you probably know what the Black Death is, or at least you've heard of it. It is a horrible, or it was a horrible disease, or maybe I should say is, because I guess it still exists in some places. A horrible disease which, in history, in two years that it existed in Europe, killed over 30% of Europeans, roughly from 1347 to 1348. The disease was so powerful, and the healthcare institutions that existed at the time were so powerless that people who contracted this disease died sometimes within 12 hours of getting it. That's how serious it was. Now, you might be wondering, why is it a critical juncture? I'm going to tell you. The reason is because over 30% of the population died. This affected the existing political and economic balance that was present in the societies in Europe at the time. It affected it in different ways, however. And we're going to see now two examples of how different societies reacted to this Black Death. In the first case, in England, in Great Britain generally, there were more inclusive systems that existed at the time. Landlords had fewer rights, and when peasants realized that 30% of their countrymen had died, they understood, well, we're still here. You know, we don't have to work for pennies anymore. We could ask for higher wages, and that's exactly what they did. They organized themselves in small towns, and they started asking their landlords for higher wages to work on their land. And the ones that didn't give them the wages they wanted, those peasants went to the cities and the small towns and started to become tradesmen, such as iron workers or carpenters or other artisans that existed at the time. In Eastern Europe, that wasn't the case. What happened in Eastern Europe is what we refer to as the second serfdom. In Russia, landlords had tons of power, and they usually had their own personal armies, not, uh, not totally dissimilar to the way Russia functions today, actually. So the institutions that existed there were more extractive. Landlords forced their peasants to work under threat of injury or death or starvation, or however they wanted to punish them. So these institutions that existed before were extractive. After the Black Death, they became even more extractive. Uh, so the third one is the World War II. Uh, probably all of you guys know what, uh, what happened in the World War II, but let me give a brief explanation. So the war, war was fought through uh, the, in the Europe uh, most of the time, but there were additionally America and Japan too. So 64 million people died during the uh, World War. So uh, basically because of uh, nuclear attacks and Holocaust and basically the war itself. And I want you guys to imagine what 64 million is. Like 64 million people died in the war and it's the current population of the England itself. So why is the World War II a critical juncture? Well, after time, we started to develop our economy, political structures, and infrastructures. But in the case of World War II, all of them got destroyed, and we had to rebuild them. So as a result, the Europe uh, divided in two groups, the Eastern side and the Western side. The Western side was more inclusive from the start, even before World War II. So the, the people living there had uh, rights to say, state their minds, and had rights to choose their governments. But in the case of East Europe, it was uh, the exactly opposite, and they were, uh, the government controlled the people, and they 
couldn't state their minds freely. So even though both of the eastern side and the western side had the same war, both of them had different outcomes. For, uh, in the case of West Europe, the western side, they improved themselves and became the countries that rule the world right now, the biggest world countries like England, France. And uh, as we come to the eastern side, they only become, uh, they were extracted even before the World War II and they started to get even worse than uh, what they started. Right, so now we're coming back around to the point why nations fail. In fact, this was uh, quite a famous development book that was released in 2012 by two economists from MIT. Uh, it explored exactly these themes about critical junctures, about the power of institutions, and uh, the success and failure of nations based on the strength of their institutions. What I want to say is that even though, as we pointed out in each case, in the agricultural revolution, in the uh, Black Death in Europe and during World War II, the same countries in the same regions faced the same critical juncture, but the way countries left that critical juncture, uh, it determined their trajectory for generations and it's quite hard to reverse the trajectory once it's already in motion. However, what I want to say is the differences in institutions can change the course in history. This is the most important point. Building strong institutions in our society is what we should all aim to do. How do we do that? Well, as I said, institutions are the places that we rely on for the services that we get in our society. Um, generally, the countries that are the most successful and the ones with the most money are the ones that have the most reliable institutions. I want to say that um, if you want to build good institutions in your society, it's going to make a difference over a long period of time. But again, it's something worth it to do. History is not destiny. This is according to the authors of this book. History doesn't repeat itself. However, we can notice the same patterns in history then when we study history, we can take these patterns and try to alter our behavior so that the trajectory of our lives and our societies goes in directions that are more preferable to us. Now you might be wondering, you're the youth, how do I build on my own institutions that are strong and reliable in my society? Well, I don't want to say there's nothing you can do. There is in fact things that you can do. And the first thing that everybody should do if you want to build a society that everybody can be proud of, is you have to be aware. You have to be aware, number one, of your rights as a citizen. Number two, you have to be aware of your own history. Start with your own country, read about your own country, and branch out from there to the rest of the world. And number three, you have to be aware of the politics that go on in your country, no matter how much you hate talking about politics or how much you might disagree with the politicians that are in power at any given time. The second thing, in building institutions is starting with your communities. You have to be a role model to people in your communities if you want them to change in a positive direction. That means you've got to follow the rules of your society. You have to stop when you see a red traffic light. You have to throw trash in the trash can, not on the ground. You have to do the little things that might not occur to you, but the things that every functioning and healthy society relies on and relies on its citizens to do to continue being functioning. You've got to vote and you've got to participate in the political process. Again, you might hate politics, you might not be interested at all, but you don't have a choice. If you're not aware, you can't change anything. That's the truth. And the last thing is, I encourage everybody in this room, especially our students at Ted Atakent and the adults in the room, volunteer and take part in community building. Take the time, give your free time, whatever you have, to making small talk even with your neighbors, and then moving from that to getting to know the people who live around you. These are the things that you can do in your own society, in your own small world, to make your country a better place and build the institutions in your country. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for coming here.